Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 10th annual Boston Real Abilities Film Festival. This is our special live Mother's Day event with the makers of the award-winning Wildflower. My name is Kat Gareshka, and I am the festival director, and I'm very excited to introduce our guests today. And let me start by introducing my co-moderator today, Paul Chiozzi, who is in his sixth sixth year at Cotting School and works in the development office as director of annual giving. Paul has been the liaison between Cotting and the Boston Real Abilities Film Festival since 2016. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Great to be here. And we are both delighted to have with us today the makers of Wildflower. Producer Brian Weedling is an award-winning filmmaker whose own journey from world-class athlete to amputee serves as the driving force behind his mission to amplify and underserved voices. He co-founded Tumbleweed Entertainment in 2006, uh, which is a production company dedicated to pioneering unparalleled content that he hopes will boldly re-examine how we depict and embrace people of all abilities. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Katka. Great to be here. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> to you too. Thank you. Uh, and director Matt Smuckler has made a name for himself with heartfelt films with a universal resonance. His films are often championed for being authentically touching, due largely to subtle direction and naturalistic performances. His duck spot for I Ams, which tells the tale of a boy's lifelong bond with his dog, earned him a 2016 AICP nomination for Best Direction. In 2018, he won two Can Silver Lions for his prostate cancer awareness campaign. Wildflower is his first feature length documentary and he's now in pre-production for a narrative film inspired by the documentary. Welcome, Matt. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. And last but absolutely not least, we have with us Wildflower herself, Christina Stoll, who really needs no introduction for those of you who saw the film. Um, but, and I want to go directly to you with this slightly impossible question, Christina. Um, it would be great if you could fill us in on how your life has been since the completion of the film, how your parents are doing right now, and um, where has life taken you? All right, thank you for having me, and happy Mother's Day to everyone. Um, first part of your question, where has it taken me? Essentially, I'm currently in Florida. I'm studying at Eckerd College. I've had numerous opportunities um, that I've been able to take and really enjoy um, studying biology at Eckerd College. So it's, it's great, it's phenomenal. And it's really turned my life around in a way that I had never expected. Um, it's really eye-opening at looking at the film alone as a third party person. So it's just been amazing what it's been able to do for me and my family. My parents are currently at home, staying safe with COVID, and uh, my dad retired, and my mom's uh, currently on unemployment because obviously everything shut down, and they're just um, working it out. A few struggles here, there, but they're doing fairly well. And then, um, what was the last part of your question? Where has life has taken you? Where you know where has it taken you since the completion of the film? I mean, it's been a few years. We see yeah. you as a as an eighteen year old. You're twenty four. Are you twenty three now? Yes, twenty three. Twenty three. Yeah. So it's it's taken me loads of places. I've been to New York and spent time with a great family there, who I adopted as my own extended family, and got to work on editing alone, like with film essentially, which I never thought I would do doing a area in production and post editing that was phenomenal and I couldn't be more grateful. It's also allowed me to go to school and be able to fulfill my dreams and aspirations as far as, you know, doing work with 
environmental conservation and being able to just grow as a human being. I've learned so many different things and turn different avenues and I expect to explore more. So I can't say that it stops here. It just continues to grow and change um, rapidly. <laughs> I, I want to hear more about that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let Paul ask a question of our producer yeah. directors. Thanks, Christina. Everybody, thank you for for having me. As as Katka said, I represent Cotting School. It's an amazing place in Lexington, Massachusetts, um, for students ages three to twenty two with disabilities. And uh, a few of my colleagues joined me in in watching this film. And uh, some of the stories, some of the questions I'll be bringing tonight represent. Um, our community. So, so thank you. I want to hear a little bit from Brian and, and Matt about the process with this film. We hear pieces at the beginning or at some point in the film that it started out as a college application piece and obviously became something more. But when you both committed to this project, is the is what we see at the end what you intended to uh, produce when you started? I'm going to give this one to Matt. Um, I'll start, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that initially, um, honestly, it was really about just go going out there and, and, and helping Christina um, visually kind of display what she, what she was up to. I mean, she, you know, and she was she, sort of this amazing track star and, and I kept hearing all these things about her. And I was like, I want to just go there and with a camera and let's just see, um, you know, and I think that you know our families are very private and so there was a little bit of a you know i don't think people are all that interested in that but as soon as i saw what she really truly was was up to um and i brought back a little bit of footage then it became a pretty clear to everybody that we need to keep keep going and and ultimately yeah i think we wanted to open some doors for her um i wanted people to see how extraordinary she was and i didn't think that they could do that by reading an essay alone i thought that it really required you know people to actually see it and so that's kind of, um, and it, it did sort of take a life of its own, but at the end of the day, this is exactly what I wanted for her. I wanted her to be able to go to college and just to fulfill these dreams of hers that I knew that she would just take down one at a time and, and be exceptional at. And then in terms of Brian, you know, it's interesting because there was a version of this film that was, um, you know, at some point with a documentary, you don't, I don't think you ever feel like it's finished. And so at some point we sort of realized, okay, this is, or at least for me, it was like, all right, you know, I've been kind of bothering the family enough, you know, and I was, I was there and I was like, you know what, maybe we could figure out a version of this film with the footage I had. And, and Brian saw it and Brian kind of, he got me at a time when I was really just, I think just pretty burnt out on it. And he Horrible. kind of was the fire to keep going, honestly. And, and really, so for the second half of the movie, Brian um, was, was really instrumental in terms of us just just giving me a renewed interest in the whole thing, and 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 you know, honestly, thank, thankfully, so. You know, I also think that uh, it was a fresh face was needed with the family. That if Matt kept going back there, that they were just going to be like, well, when's this coming out? When's this coming out? But <laughs> you know, putting my face in front of them gave them someone new to sort of. Uh, figure out and see see who I was and they could ask me when's it coming when's it coming and I could give them new answers that you know sounded different from Matt's and um, it was really when when Matt brought me into the process it was just a time where it just needed more shooting it was uh, a story that was sort of being pulled out to to be a, a feature length but I kept saying to him I think you got about two-thirds of the film and there's still things that need to happen so it was really just about convincing him to say let's just keep going out there keep bringing cameras and sound and seeing what's going on in her life and and just wait till things begin to happen and um, you know the, through most of it I, I kind of felt like boy I'd love to see Christina get to this place where she makes these realizations in her life and we can use that to finish out the film. And by the time we did finish out the film, the way she wrote her essay and motivated herself to get into college and really did everything on her own to make her, her life and her dreams happen, uh, to be sort of sitting uh, from a bird's eye view watching her make that happen. It was, it was by the end, it was really satisfying to see who she became as a person besides just who she was as a character in the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Brian, I mean, you you know, we we had a chance to speak beforehand and and here we are on Zoom, which is it's such an interesting perspective for 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 people, you know, during COVID when we spend so much time on Zoom. 
you do refer to yourself every once in a while as a guy with one arm and one leg. Right. And, and I know that it, you know, at least in your perspective, had had a lot to do with with your work on this film and how you connected to it and your and how you brought in your perspective as you know a person coming from the disability community and you know I, and I want to I want to ask you you know what what that meant for you and you know what you were able to bring to the film um, through that but I also want to spin off to Matt and Christina about about how they felt about you know having you on. And I know that you, you know, aside from being the producer, you 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 actually shot uh, a good chunk of the film uh, as a cinematographer. So, so that's um, just just here and there when I was the only one available. If if we had the budget and the, and the better hands, we we definitely went with someone else. Great. Um, uh, you know, for for me, I, I spend most of my career not trying to say that I'm a producer or a director that has disabilities. Um, I, I didn't find that it was it was to my advantage, really, the way most people look at us in the world. So I did more um, trying to wear a long sleeve shirt and a pair of pants that would hide my prosthetic and hide the fact that my arm was mangled. And um, and it was really through the process of this film where I started to really open up and understand sort of my power and my gift as someone with a disability and how I could use that to help in this film. You know, when I first, you know, was told about this by Matt, I was more interested in Christina's story than mom or dad. You know, mom, mom and dad uh, ha have their, uh, their disabilities. Christina has no disabilities. Christina just has a tough situation. But I, I identified with her tough situation because I had my accident as a 17 year old. So um, my life changed very dramatically as I was supposed to get ready to go to college. So watching her go through this very important time in life and see how she was navigating it essentially on her own was something that I just, I, I globbed onto. And so I was, I was really there originally for Christina's story and who she was as a person and what she was dealing with. By the end of it, I really felt like um, having a disability made a difference for me in how I approach the subject, how I learned how to approach Mike and how I approach Sheila and, um, and learned how to have different set of patience for people where people have had to have different set of patience for me over time. You know, even when you see me like tying my shoes, you might go, can I help you? And I'd be like, no, 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 I can do it. I can do it. It just takes a little longer. Um, so it was, it was really, for me, it was uh, sort of opening up who I am as a, as a producer with disabilities. And, uh, you know, I felt very grateful to Matt because Matt brought me into this. He didn't look at me as someone with a disability. We had known each other for like 18 years at that point. Um, we were friends. So um, he knew me. He knew my story. This was not something where I felt I ever had to prove anything. And we didn't even talk about my disability in relation to this film until we got to like starting to submit to film festivals. Before that, it, it was just never a conversation. So, you know, to, to Matt, Matt's credit really. No, well, and I think for, for in terms of who I wanted to bring in to this, you know, this, this, fa this family, which is essentially my family, it was really important to me that I, you know, the char character of, of who I was working with and, and, and I knew that, that they would love Brian and that was also very, very important to me. So I wasn't just going to bring anybody in. And I think that was what was the most important part for me. Um, it, honestly, that was all, all really I was thinking about. Well, I, did you want to add? Something? Yeah, uh, of course. I'd like to just say, like, Brian's character really reflected on the film and on our family. We are very close knit and do not allow just anyone. Um, we're particular in that way. And so when Brian came on, we had to devote our trust into my uncle Matt that this would be a person that'd be worthwhile to spend time with and also would respect who we are just as people. And we never saw, you know, Brian, we never even had the perception of like his own disability as an entity towards the film. It just never arose essentially we just look at people as people and we didn't see very much into it and we love brian and we couldn't be more thankful for him to be here and if it would have been just some 
random person for different reasons or different, um, you know, to develop a different type of merit or credit, it would have probably reflected the film differently and negatively. So we're very grateful that it was him and we chose him. Thank you all. I, I, um, I think this is a, a good segue into a, a next question. And I'd love to hear any of you respond to this. Um, it, it's probably more directed towards Brian um, or Matt, but one of the one of the reactions that I and some of my colleagues had to the film at times was, you know, look at look at poor Christina, look at all the things she has to do in her life as a child, right? On the other hand, as an advocate for people with disabilities, one of the reactions I had was, well, wait a second, what did the filmmakers intend for us to think about the rights for people with, you know, developmental disabilities and whether or not they should be married and having children. So I wonder, and this is this this can be a difficult topic, obviously, um, but I wonder if there was it ever occurred to you during or maybe after the film, what are, what will the disability community, um, how will they react to this? And are we trying to send a message or do we just want people to view it and discuss like we're doing now? No, I mean, I'll start, I'll start. But um, for me, it was, it was initially, it was very important to not um, be too heavy handed at all, honestly, but it was pretty hard as Christina's uncle and someone who loves her and sees her and is, and you know, very dramatically and passionately believe she should be here. So, and seeing the way that it was really important for me to um, show how her parents very capably are able to, were able to, to you know, give her all this um, love. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, it was the most pure form of love that I really have ever seen. I mean, it's a very genuine, pure um, form of love and, and without criticism, which you know, so it was really kind of a very beautiful thing for me. I, I knew going in, but then seeing it, and then I just sort of at one, some point was like, you know what, to hell with it. I don't really care if people um, think I'm trying to push some, you know, like this agenda that yes, uh, someone with a disability is is able to have a child. And, it, you know, because it's just such a natural, um, it was so natural for, for her mom um, in many ways to, in terms of the love and the caring. There's obviously there's other things that Christina didn't get, but in terms of that pure love um, and 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 not being critical, I thought was a uh, was very very beautiful and touching. So I at, at some point I was like, you know what? If I, it's hard for me to be completely impartial. You know, there there was a point um, I'd say sort of two thirds of our way through the creative process where Matt and I were discussing if we were going to put a very overt message about this, maybe even angle something at the beginning or the end of the film um, that would let you sort of start the discussion uh, about whether, you know, uh, people should, with disabilities should be having children, what's, what's the line kind of thing. And it always just felt like, no, that's not the right thing for the film. Um, it's kind of like, let the conversation get started by what what is in there and then and then let's have a conversation about it but this movie was not about to lecture it was about to illustrate um someone's life and you know christina doesn't have have the the disability but she lives and loves two people that have have some disabilities and she um has had to navigate her her own unique way in this world. So um, dealing with those disabilities. Um, so it's, it's a really, it's a unique story, but um, you know, as Matt said, you know, he, he always believed that Christina was someone that should exist. And from the moment that I met her, she was just so smart and so full of life and so determined and, um, and very headstrong. And those, those, those are the qualities that have, you know, gotten her, out of her hometown and got her into a four-year college and has her on the road to uh, to success. I like I mean, it's certainly very clear that from the film that you know we all believe that Christina should exist. And I want to I want to ask you, Christina. You, at some point in the film, you say that the biggest fear you had growing up was that at some point you too would have a disability or discover that you have a disability of some kind, and. What I found interesting is what, like, at what point in growing up as a child did you actually realize that the parents that were raising you had had disabilities? Well, reflecting on my mom, I think 
realization for it being inherently given to me was not until I was much older, you know, 15, 16. Whereas as a child, I was just trying to, you know, do what I needed to do to keep myself afloat and then um, participate in whatever was necessary to the household. Um, the way that I reflect on it and still see it today is it's not very different from other, you know, countries where um, kids grow up doing the things that I did in very independently, uh, just with supervision, whereas I didn't have the supervision doing it, where, you know, there would be children who would turn on stoves by themselves at age four, as long as the parents watching from, you know, the side, whereas I would just do it myself and cook myself. So something that came from that, where I was nervous about, you know, becoming intellectually impaired in some way, or even physically was because I had felt like I had an enhanced abilities. I knew that I was a track star and I knew that I was very smart and competent. And so if that was taken away from me, I felt very threatened by it. Whereas if you're, you know, born or essentially you get this um, disability later on, you know, it, it changes things. But looking now, I don't think it's as scary as it was then because all I had was me, 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 me. And taking some part of me and losing that was upsetting. And that's why it was so, um, like that's why it was mentioned and that's why I, it was such a fear. But now I, I could care less what happens essentially. I've been through hell and back, but I think that people shouldn't take a negative effect on what I said as far as like my fear. It was more so losing myself. I was afraid of losing myself. And as a teenager, that's what you go through as a regular teen. And people need to see that, reflect on that, that you go through these different hormonal changes and you're experiencing life in this fast, rapid chaos as a young kid. And to add my family on top of it was just something else, which made me more fearful, which now when you get older and you overcome, you know, that chaos, it's not nearly as threatening. Yeah. There, there's actually a question from the audience um, that's about your accident, which, you know, we, 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 we see sort of the aftermath of in the film, which is really uh, terrifying. Uh, and the, the question is, after your accident, did your relationship with your parents change? Yes, I'm also typing it out so they have it. But essentially, um, it changed slightly. It became more intimate, where we were more connected with each other on a you know emotional level whereas I had just you know been through school and I would start just doing things independently leaving the house a lot um, going to be with friends and just kind of staying clear of my family because I wanted to just be who I am and they gave me that freedom to allow me to do that and so when that happened, I was, you know, bedridden for six to eight months. I couldn't watch TV, right? I had to essentially relearn <sighs> all my abilities um, because of the, the way that the brain waves, um, the neurons would attach. If I did too much, I could essentially put myself in a worse position because I had a brain bleed. But um, with that, you know, they nurtured me in a sense where, they would just make sure I had food and, and just ask me constantly if I was okay. Obviously, I still did things by myself. I would crawl myself to the bathroom, mainly because I'm very stubborn and I don't always like to receive help. Even if they're capable of doing so, I'm like, nah, nah, I got it. So I would crawl myself to the bathroom or crawl myself to uh, the kitchen to get what I needed. Um, and then my dad gave me, you know, his bedroom because I had a loft bed. And so I was not capable of going up the loft bed to sleep. So I slept in his room and he uh, went to sleep with my mom, which was difficult for him, uh, but it worked. And so they were willing to do some, you know, very menial sacrifices that meant the world to me. So obviously it was a bit of a sort of filmmaker ethical challenge for you guys, Matt and Brian, you know, 
it's like it's in the, it's the sort of the obvious you know instinct reaction of a filmmaker keep shooting but but there well, are, that, that's this, when brian this, became the cinematographer this is your niece right <laughs> right well no. no literally that's when brian became the cinematographer it was absolutely there was no version of me doing that i couldn't do it and so Brian went and he was in the, he went and he filmed it at times on his iPhone in that when, when Christina was in, in the hospital, um, that was, that was kind of when Brian turned into a cinematographer. <laughs> um, that was kind of, uh, and it was, I didn't know, I didn't know what the answer was. I knew that obviously all I was thinking about was how was, you know, is she okay? We got woken up at four in the morning hearing that she, you know, at one point was on life support. So it was really, and then Brian just kind of went out there. Well, you know, um, uh, yeah, I was, it was very difficult. That was something. It was, was, it was like the next day. I just got in the car and, and drove. Yeah, out. which I wouldn't have been able to do. Period. So it's just, um, I think that that was, yeah. I, I, mean, I, that, that, I had no hesitation about it. I I had actually uh, worked on a film five six years previous, and one of the characters in the film had gone into a coma, and her sister called me and said, "You need to come film this. This might be the end." I said. I don't know how comfortable I am with that. She's like, no, you have to come film it. We'll figure it out later. So I'd already been through an experience where I went into something where it was very tenuous. I didn't know what was really going to happen, but I knew you go get the footage and then you figure out later what will be appropriate depending on what happens with the situation. I mean, when I first went in there, it, you know, Christina had tubes and, you know, really looked in, in rough shape and it was quite scary. And you know, seeing her parents by the bedside was uh, was pretty emotional for me. And I usually have a, a decent ability to sort of keep my emotions in, in check. But it was uh, it was definitely one of those um, experiences that uh, that put that to the test. Um, and so uh, it was like that time. And then as she got better, maybe a couple of weeks later, I went back and we did an interview where, I mean, she was still, you know, just barely coming out of it and, you know, was in, in that interview was expressing things, you know, that, you know, she had not shared before. And I think it was because she had finally been put into such a vulnerable state physically that she was now just sort of leaking out some other vulnerable things emotionally as well. And I will say just to the, the question that was raised, I mean, for what I saw from her mom, I mean, it was, it was very moving for me to see when, um, you know, Sheila actually said to her own mom, like, I got this, I can handle it. I, I'm going to take care of it when her mom wanted to come out and help. And, and I think that was a really, um, you know, not a turning point, but it really showed you that she got it. She was ready to take care of her daughter and, and, you know, and make sure that, that she did. And, and we saw that, that she was able to do that. Yeah. Yep. Matt, I, I want to make a comment about the love that you um, have referenced a few times. Um, without a doubt that shines through loud and clear in the film and that's the way I've tried to describe the film to other people is that that love and I, I uh, you know Christine I hope you would you would you would agree that he did a good job both of these these guys did a good job capturing that but I, I wanted to um to ask you a question Christina about about your kind of your life now. Um, I imagine in a, going to school in the same hometown district with the same people, you have an identity um, with, with your parents and you get to a new, um, you're out of state now, a new place. When you walk around in college or and meet new people, how much of your story do you share? How much of it influences the way that you relate with others and, and build relationships and, um, and so on? So actually, um, even living in the hometown, it wasn't apparent that, you know, my mom had this disability unless it was request, you know, questioned or requested from someone. I never really went about and been like, here's this clutch or here's this um, fact about me. And it's not because I was nervous about telling anyone. It was more so just, I didn't feel like it was relevant to anything I was doing or relevant to whatever was going on. And I didn't want to make life all about me in a sense where, you know, I'm hanging out with someone or meeting someone new, or even as far as going to college and speaking with my professors, it was just not something that I felt was worthwhile to bring up essentially. And I knew that it didn't change the matter of the fact in a sense where if someone asked me no problem, I would easily tell them the full story. 
Um, but if they didn't ask, it wasn't really brought up because it's not something I constantly think about where I'm like, hmm, my mom is handicapped. No, it's just something that was, you know, in my life. And I don't, I still can't see it as like a full, like, I don't know. I don't see it as something as separate from another family. I think everyone has, you know, something going on that could be, you know, a struggle or a problem within their family. And I see that this is mine. And so that's the only difference. And so I didn't think it was worthwhile to be like, let me set myself apart by saying these things and telling them about these interpersonal um, information and, and, connections with my family. One of the things that I really loved about the film, Matt, and this is specifically to you is, is and I find as a documentary filmmaker myself, it's really hard to do when you're dealing with a serious subject and you are keep, you manage to pull, pull to, you know, to throw in as much humor as mm. you did. And, and you know, with dealing with the situation that you're dealing with, you do it in a way that at no point feels exploitative mm -hmm. at all. And so my question really is, how did Mike and Sheila react to the film when they first saw it? Yeah, I mean, that's it's really that's more for Christina. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, it, for me, it was really. Um, I, I showed Christina, Christina was over at our house when she first saw, she saw various iterations of this thing. And it was just, you know, for me, it was, I, it was most important that she felt good about it. And then I knew that her parents, you know, would, I, I would think also, um, I think that I, I, I'll let her talk about it, but I think there's a little bit of, it's probably a little bittersweet in terms of, um, for, from them. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I, I hear, I mean, know that, uh, that Christina's mom, um, really liked it, loved it. And then, I don't know, someone that she knew saw it and then suddenly maybe she wasn't as, as excited about it. But I do think that she, um, I just know that she really wants to get on Ellen DeGeneres to talk about the film. And then if we can do that, I think she'll be very happy. But she already has the dance down. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, Christina might be able to be, be better answer this. Yeah, essentially um, when at first, when they were first seen, um, and in you know the view of all these people, they didn't really mind it. And then they were getting feedback from people that they had not expected, or they'd gotten feedback where they're like, "Well, we still don't see how this is that important." And so they had some change in how they viewed the film. But overall, I think they're pleased. They're nitpicky as far as certain scenes that were cut. That you know, my dad's like, "I'm upset because certain parts of the slot car track are not in there, or certain things that he was very." Um, proud of so that's he, they're nitpicky but they are pleased with the overall result and they're very happy with what it's been able to accomplish and do and overall we just want it to inspire people and just be you know something light and not so heavy even though the context is heavy so uh, ultimately they're they're okay with it they're happy with it and you know they'll give you their notes such as I would give notes but it's nothing <laughs> to where is catastrophe in the household. It's just something we brush over every other time. We have a question from, from the audience, uh, really with a comment and that reads wonderful film. Um, and then the question goes, who has taken over the day-to-day -day at the house, such as managing their money since Christina, you now are at college? So uh, it's still kind of in interconnected. Uh, my dad and I, he shares my bank account and we kind of uh, share some stuff there. But he is overall the main person who handles all responsibilities and he always has. I was just there as more of a consultant and imagine a financial advisor who would say, this is why you want to do this. Let's put this out on the table and look at these elements and see what's more beneficial. And so I still do that. So he'll call me, explain what's going on. I'll give him my notes. I'll tell him what he should and should not do. And most of the time he takes my advice. Sometimes he doesn't, but um, overall it works really well. And if they ever seriously run into a problem, I'm going to back them up. Like I'm there and regardless. I tell them no matter what I'm trouble I am in, I'll put them before me. 
Nice. Well, Probably not something you would have said at, uh, at 17 or 18 either. Yeah. I, um, I wanted to ask another a question, maybe just because you're in the family, Matt or Christina can speak to this. Um, some of the folks in my community were curious just about the supports that are out there for people with disabilities. They're, they're limited, you know, um, for, for, for support systems that um, perhaps Christina, your parents, had access to or didn't have access to. It doesn't seem like we're, we we see part of the picture. Um, there's some tough moments. I think one of your grandmothers has some pretty strong opinions about about what's going on in your house. And, um, you know, you chose to keep that, you know, include that in the film. But um, can you speak a little bit to just the supports that you had as in your family growing up or, or that you didn't have and could have used or, or something along those lines? So essentially, we didn't receive state help um, whatsoever. Each state is different as how far they manage, um, you know, their the Disabilities Act and how um, they manage their people. And so my mom had to sign an agreement um, back in 2000, rough, oh gosh, roughly 2003, 2005, I think. I'm not 100% on the exact timestamp, but she had to sign a document that stated that she was rehabilitated in order to work. They refused to allow her to work um, full time or even part time in the casino industry, which is mainly what is out there um, without being rehabilitated. So she had to sign these documents, even though that wasn't necessarily true. And that um, they've obviously done work now where they allow things, but um, that withheld her and withheld us from receiving any outside help whatsoever. And it was difficult because my dad didn't know the avenues on what he should do as far as like organizations, other than what you would do for federal state, um, you know, like aid. And I didn't know either. So we just left it as it was and we didn't receive any help. And she could have probably benefited from psychological, you know, um, help and assessments and benefited from being able to just join activities that are more her pace. But we didn't get any of that because essentially you deem yourself good to go, even though you're not. And then you had to pay out of pocket because insurances didn't cover um, most insurances from the casino industry didn't cover um, mental um, illness or mental health, which is still a current issue. Um, they wouldn't pay to have her reassign, like reassess to say that she is disabled to get um, aid and to get help with our family. So we just left it because it became more of a hurdle to try and get help than it was to just accept what it was and do our own thing. So I'm sure now there are many other things that allow people more access, more um, help and more advancements, but it was, it was tough. Thank you, that is a, that, 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 that continues and you're right, state to state um, varies quite a bit, but um, no, I appreciate you reflecting on that a little bit. It's helpful for, I know some of the folks in our community that were really curious about that. Matt, you totally kept yourself off camera in the film. Well, your voice was was fairly present. I mean, did you have any you know apprehension about the choice at any point? I mean, did you feel like maybe because you are Christina's uncle, which really comes across towards the very end, and only really if you pay very much attention, <laughs> frankly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that's you're right, and I I think that was a conscious decision early on, and probably a, a bad one. I don't know. I just was like, I didn't want anybody to know. I was just like, I knew this was such a fascinating story. And I just thought I didn't want people to, to think that, oh, this is, you know, that I had such a strong perspective one way or another. And so I just wanted it, I wanted to just kind of just to be omniscient, I suppose. And, um, and then, uh, then it just started to become more and more clear that I think it was, it was, it was okay for me to, um, to, to, uh, you know, people, realized that oh it's, it's her uncle I just but yeah it was a choice early on and that's kind of why I think I just was very much trying to be invisible and just I really just wanted to document it I guess um and and really just be fly on the wall and that was it yeah uh, we have a question for Christina from the chat um 
that's about whether you now believe, I, I, actually, it could be a question for all of you guys. Uh, what do you believe now about adults with disabilities, intellectual or and physical disabilities having children? Um, and then there's another question that it's really more for you, Christina, and that's what is your after story? Marriage, a dozen kids, work, school. <laughs> That's All right. a good question. Um, we'll start with the first one about the disabilities for um, parents. Essentially, I believe anybody is capable and should be allowed uh, because of the fact that even though they have a disability, there are plenty of other parents that have other habits or issues that still are allowed to have children. So it's an equal playing field, no one should be able to take that right away. I think that's a human right to be able to procreate and choose if you're going to procreate or not. Um, as far as the second question, what is the after story? I'm not a conventional person. So essentially marriage is nice, but it's not something that I require to have to fulfill my life. Um, if I get married, great. If I don't, great too. It doesn't bother me. Um, I love being in a relationship, but it's not the ultimate decider of my, you know, end game goal. Uh, children, same, same way. I feel the same. If I have them, great. If I don't, awesome too. If I, if I don't, I'll probably be, you know, the auntie that goes and spoils um, the other, my friend's kids obviously because I'm an only child but it's not something that I need or require in my life um, work in school school currently is something that I'm trying to achieve and do want out of my life considering the fact that my job field would need school like it's science so you can't just go in you you have to learn whereas other uh, trades can be something where you don't go to school. So school is necessary and a requirement to, for me to be, feel for me to feel fulfilled. And then work, I would like to work where it's something I'm giving back tenfold. I don't want to work a nine to five. I currently work with a great two great um, companies. I work with Shelton and Steel Law Firm, and we're you know working to get um legal well, I'm a legal recruiter so we're looking to get other people into a place that they want to be and essentially I want the same thing for myself I want to work where I want to be and not see work as like a nine to five where I live to work versus work to live um that's what I want and I also work at like this place called the dog bar and I go and I just involve myself with a bunch of dogs daily and that's amazing. And I get to bring my dog. So that's, I'm really comfortable where I'm at now. And now that I'm in this zone where I'm in a great workplace, I don't want anything less. And I don't think anyone should want anything less. Matt, Brian, what's the story with the narrative film based on this documentary? Yeah, it's, it's ongoing. I mean, we're, um, I mean, in, the documentary is, we're talking to a company now that's talking about distrib distributing it. And then the narrative is, um, yeah, not a ton to talk about other than it's, it's um, there's a production company that's come on board and um, we're, we're excited to kind of use, like um, it's really inspired by, I would say. So it's quite different, but inspired by. How Christina's. do you feel about it, Christina? <laughs> I mean, I was low-key hurt that I couldn't be my own actress again because <laughs> I was so great at it and- You were. Thank you. <laughs> but um, I think it'd be really interesting to see how much more dramatized it'll be. Essentially, to me, it's like very melodramatic and doesn't, I don't know, it didn't hurt, like it didn't feel so like scary or eye opening in the beginning. And, and now I'm like, okay, I want to see it from somebody else who can really make this feel like a so you want more drama about your life? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see it. I mean, not more drama in my life per se, but I do want to see what other people take from it and think like, and if I had to cast myself, it'd be, there's some notes, so. <laughs> you know where to find me, Christina. I know. <laughs> this, 
This is so great. Paul, do you have a final question? Because we have time for zero, but you get the final question. Well, and perhaps one of you can just answer this quickly. Now that it's finished, is there something that you either included or excluded that you wish you could have done differently? Uh, to your question, for sure, Matt. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's interesting, you know, the, when you, this documentaries, and there's so much footage and things. I mean, things that I, there, there's a couple of, of things that Christina said. There were some amazing things that she said. I don't know if you remember this, Christina, but you remember when I asked you, and it just reminded me when, when, um, when uh, Katka asked you about marriage and the question came up and you said about the coffin. Do you remember what you said when I said, oh. you believe in love? Um, yeah, <laughs> where uh, it was about. Um, I said, do you believe in love? I think, I yeah. You believe in love and I said, essentially, I go, you, you ultimately end up in the coffin alone. You can't share a coffin. Yeah, there's only room in the coffin for one. But, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is like this 18 year old or maybe 17 at the time. I was just like, it blew my mind. I mean, so there are things that Christina said that were like this wise soul where you're just, there's, <laughs> what do you say to that? You're just like, okay. Um, so there were things, there were there's certainly a bunch of uh, things like that. Um, but not, I mean, yeah, another, do I, I sort of agree with Mike. There were some amazing slot car stuff. That's a whole nother movie, yeah. you know? So um, what I've, I, and I would have loved to have continued down that path, but there are a lot of paths. Like that was what was so interesting is with Sheila, Mike also were so in, in, you know, interesting unto themselves and you sort of just wanted to follow them and see what they're up to. And so, you know, I, I just kind of, in some ways just wish we would just continue. Obviously I'm happy that it's done. And that, because <laughs> the, the whole goal was to do a little short film get Christina off to college and, and, and that's kind of what's happened. So I, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with the result as well. Great, great result. So thank you. And honestly, good luck finding a cast that can play the three of them. <laughs> Seriously. You're going to need it. Yeah. <laughs> I know who could. <laughs> All right. Call me after. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we can't wait either way, but this film is absolutely brilliant. If you haven't seen it, please watch it at Real Abilities Boston for free. I want to thank you all so much again for being here with us today. Uh, thank you to Christina Saul, Wildflower, <laughs> Matt Smuckler, and Brian Wielding, um, and my co-moderator, Paul Chosey. And many thanks to Cotting School also for supporting tonight's event. Uh, we wanna give a shout out to all mothers or quasi mothers, Christina, you get a shout out for sure, uh, out there today. And also to those who for various reasons are unable to celebrate Mother's Day today. And in keeping with mother stories, I wanna invite you all to join us tomorrow night for a very special conversation with the makers of Scattering CJ. And remember that you can watch Scattering CJ and all the festival films online for free through May 13th. Please join us for our live programs. Donate if you can, stay well, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. I wanna thank again to all of you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you, Taka. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye guys.